learner. Well, take your Bible and turn to Ephesians chapter 4 again. Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to finish up what we began last night. Now, as I said, we were looking at the negative side, and this is the positive side. The camp theme is walk worthy, walk worthy of the Lord. And you'll be hearing much more about that. We looked last night at what it means not to walk worthy of the Lord, not because we were trying to be negative, but because that's what Paul told us about in the middle of his discussion about walking worthy. I'm going to give a running start for us, read what we did last night, and then we're going to add verses 20 to 24 this morning. So let's begin in verse 17. Follow along as we hear from the word of the living God. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But, but you, speaking to Christians, he says, but you did not learn Christ this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, that you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you being renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth, that truth. For the most part, doctors make diagnoses based on symptoms. In other words, if you have a runny nose, a sore throat, watery eyes, the doctor might triangulate those symptoms and diagnose the illness. Once he's figured out what the problem is, he will treat it accordingly. But what about this? What if you walk into the emergency room with a rod of steel rebar sticking through both temples? He's not likely to say, I'm not sure. I'm just wondering what the problem is. Here's some kaopectate for your tummy and some exfoliating soap for your skin. And I hope that takes care of the rebar. It's ridiculous. But we do that kind of diagnoses and ridiculous treatments so often when it comes to our souls. If your faith is struggling, you need a diagnosis to take proper action. If your soul is sick, if you're troubled, if you're down, if you're depressed, if you're hopeless, if you're anxious, if you're fearful, do you understand what the proper diagnosis is of what's truly happening? If you have something major go wrong and you have the wrong diagnosis, you can be in a lot of trouble unless you have the appropriate cure and treatment. Accurate diagnosis leads to accurate treatment. Vague understanding leads to vague diagnoses. So, Let's start with asking just a bit of a question this morning about the quality and the focus of your faith. Are you going through a time of struggle? This is, I don't want to be a downer, but if you haven't struggled with your faith, you're, you're going to. And what I mean by struggle is sometimes we have debilitating doubts, and we need those doubts answered by, by excellent theologians like Dr. Ware, Dr. Strand. We need to read good books. We have good uh, Bible commentaries and dictionaries and encyclopedias, and your pastor can help you with 
specific doubts in your faith, but sometimes we, we struggle with our own hearts. And usually that struggle as a believer comes to the point of failing to understand what our faith really is and what our faith is truly in. Internal struggles, emotional instability, upsetting doubts. These are really theological problems disguised as earthly troubles. And again, wrong thinking about Jesus and salvation will lead to debilitating spirals of distance from God. He never leaves us, but our faith can make us, or lack of faith can make us move away from that intimacy with him. What's the most famous verse in the Bible? John 3.16, right? It's held up at football games. I always, I always laugh a little bit when, when people hold up John 3.16 because they're wanting people who don't know the Bible and don't know God to read that verse, and most of the people who need that verse don't have a Bible. But anyway, hold up for God so loved the world that he, I mean, hold up the, the anyway, I, I digress. Um, put up the verse. I love this verse, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. But what do we love about that verse? What promise does it contain that makes the the verse so universally attractive and universally helpful. It's, it's what? Eternal life. Living forever, right? Now, if we have pop quiz, I'm not going to, but I, I had you all take out a piece of paper and I said, okay, you have 10 seconds to define eternal life. I think I know what most of you would say. Well, this is not really hard. Eternal life. Living Forever. Eternal, forever, life, living. You probably think you made 100 on that, right? Would it surprise you if I told you that was not Jesus' definition of eternal life? Living forever? Now, if you're like me and you heard something like that, your, your immediate question is, how can it mean anything but that? Just for a moment, turn over to John chapter 17. I want you to see this with your own eyes. You know, John 17 is the, is the real Lord's Prayer. We usually call the Lord's Prayer, you know, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, in Matthew chapter 6. That's really the disciples' prayer because the Lord could have never prayed that prayer as his prayer. You understand that? Forgive us this day our sins. Our, the Lord couldn't pray that. He is sinless. This is the high priestly prayer. This is the real Lord's prayer. And no, no human could ever pray this prayer. John 17 is one of my favorite sections, one of my favorite pieces of real estate in all of God's word. It was one of the first series I preached when I came to Mission Road Bible Church. I mean, look, just for a minute, look for a second, um, verse 5. Can you imagine, just, just for a second... Use your sanctified imagination and go back to this moment with me. Jesus is standing outside of the Garden of Gethsemane. He's about to take three disciples part way in and go have his passion begin, his suffering begin. And they all probably gather in a circle. They're standing, which was the Jewish custom, and he begins to pray. He prayed all the time. He prayed so much the disciples at one point said, Lord, will you teach us how to pray like you? So they're standing there. And he starts praying. Have you ever had someone pray and you just, it was such an alarming prayer that you found yourself in a group kind of looking up going, did you, did you hear that? This would have been one of those moments. I, I wish I had a video of this moment in the disciple's life. Listen to this. Just, he says a lot that we could comment on, but just for a minute, listen to what he says in verse 5. Now, Father... Glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Who prays that? Have you ever been in a prayer group and someone said, You know, 
Father, I remember before the world began and you and I were conversing about the creation of the universe. I remember those days just like it was yesterday. You would think that person was insane. Jesus is praying about the good old days when there was no days. There were no days. Who prays like this? Who can pray about being there with the Father before the world began? Only Jesus. Well, he says something back up in verse 3 that's remarkable. He says, and he's praying with the disciples, he says, this is eternal life. Now, that's got my attention. He's about to define eternal life, right? This is eternal life, that they may live forever. Is that what he says? No. And this is eternal life, listen, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is the only place that we have recorded in the New Testament where Jesus prays in the third person with his natural name, Jesus. Oh, sometimes he talks about the Son of God or the Son of Man. This is the only time he, he prays with his name. Now, you say, well, what's strange about that? Imagine this. How odd would this sound if I began the session by saying, okay, and I, I'm not making a lot of prayer, but what if I said, Father, we're thankful for this time, and I just want to pray for Rick Holland as he preaches? Would that strike you as a little odd? This is the only account we ever have where Jesus says that they may know you, the only true God, and that they may know Jesus, which is me, Jesus, whom you've sent. What's going on here? Why is he doing that? He is emphasizing the central reality that eternal life, get this, is knowing the Father through knowing the Son, Jesus, the Messiah. Take that theology and let's go back to Ephesians chapter 4 now. I want to unpack with you walking with the Savior a little bit more intently. If you want an outline, we're going to look at three dimensions of a worthy walk. Very simple. Very, almost like what Adam talked about the first night. Three dimensions of a worthy walk. These are very simple. These are very graspable, very attainable. They, it's almost like Paul sat us down and said, this is a football. This is a baseball. This is, how, this is the sport. This is how you understand life. Three dimensions of a worthy walk. The first is this, learning about Jesus. Learning about Jesus. Now, there, there's there, sometimes, this is an odd thing to say, but sometimes really bad grammar makes really good theology. And Paul leveraged sometimes bad Greek, or which is what he wrote in bad, and is translated into bad English in order to, to communicate very good theology that would not have been translated, would not have been understood with better grammar. Let me, let me explain what I mean by that. For example, in, in Philippians 1.21, he says, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Have you ever thought about the oddity of that, that grammar. For to me, to live is Christ. Doesn't it feel like it should say, for to me, to live is loving Christ. For to me, to live is serving Christ, worshiping Christ, following Christ. All of those would have been true. He didn't say that. He says, for to me, to live life is my Savior, it's Christ. He does the exact same thing here. He says, oddly enough, speaking about their old days when they used to live and walk as a Gentile, as an unbeliever, he says, but you, different than walking like an unbeliever, like a Gentile, but you did not learn Christ in this way. By the way, it's literally learn the Messiah. You know, whether you're Jewish or not, our Savior is the Jewish Messiah. You did not learn Christ this way. 
That's a strange thing to say, isn't it? You didn't, instead of living like a Gentile, you did not learn, you wanted to say, to live like a Gentile. You did not learn good theology this way. You did not learn your, your, your doctrinal statement at your church. He says, you did not learn Christ. You did not learn Christ in this way. Turn that around. In order to be different than the world, you learned Christ. It's a past tense assessment of their faith. When you were converted, you learned something. And what you learned was the person, the theology, the work of Jesus Christ. Why does Adam bring Dr. Bruce Ware to a summer camp to talk to students? A guy who is, has been teaching theology more than all of you have been alive and some of your parents been alive, and yet he brings him to a student. What's the thinking behind that? It's this. Because he wants to take someone who's an expert on Christ, and you learn Christ. Why do that? Because Paul said that's the central curriculum that a person learns when they come to faith. Now, we, listen, we have a problem in our world today and it goes all the way back to, to Paul's day. And that is that people can mistake Christianity for something that it's not. Christianity is the inheriting of eternal life. And that's knowing God through knowing Christ. That's what Jesus himself said. But we tend to think of Christianity as, some people think of it as a social alternative to the world, right? These are people I hang well out with instead of my, the, the bad guys, these are, this is the place I go on Sundays and Wednesdays instead of those other places. It's a social alternative to the world. Now, in a sense, it is a social alternative to the world, but that's not why we, we come to faith in Christ. Some people think of it as behavior modification. Oh, I don't, I don't say those words like other people do. I don't do those things like other people do. I live differently. I act differently, which is the caboose but not the engine. You did not learn Christ in this way, in the way that you walk, in the way that you're living. What does Jesus say about this? Familiar terms, familiar words rather. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus said, I love this, I love this passage. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, listen to him talk to you right now. Listen to God speak through his son to your heart right now. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus said, come to me, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, heavy burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That doesn't make sense unless you know what a yoke is. We don't see much of yokes today. And in fact, most of the yokes are actually built a little differently than they were in the ancient Near East during Jesus and Paul's time. A yoke was something that you put on two cattle, two beasts of burden, two donkeys together. And you would put... Basically, it was a log or a, a, like a four by four that had, had arches cut out of it so you could put it on one animal and the other animal and they would go together. That's why Paul says to the Corinthians, don't be unequally yoked. If you put a cow with a goat and you say, let's go together, they're, they're going to go in a circle because one's stronger than the other. That's what it means to be unequally yoked, be equally yoked. Well, a yoke is a burden. You put that thing on a, on a horse or on a, on a cow, and they can only pull so long because it's a heavy burden. And it's meant to be heavy on purpose to keep that animal in line. Jesus uses that. He says, take my yoke, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. We'll come back to that. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. It's not like that heavy thing that you drag around Pull a cart. In the center of that, though, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Learn from me. The question is this. Have you learned 
from Christ. Is your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ or is your faith in faith about Christ? Do you just want this to be your people and your church and your social alternatives of the world and behavior modification or do you understand that Christianity is coming to a relationship with the living, resurrected Savior? The curriculum of your life as a Christian is the person of Jesus Christ. That leads us to a second dimension of a worthy walk. Listening to Jesus. Jesus said, learn from me. And that's exactly where Paul goes in verse 21. He says, you did not learn Christ in this way if... Now he begins to explain. Indeed, look at the references to Christ. You have heard him and been taught in him just as truth is where? In Jesus What do we need to hear from Jesus? These Ephesians had heard from him. Now, spoiler alert, we have no record that Jesus ever went to Asia Minor or to Ephesus. So how did they hear from him? Baked into this is the witness of other people telling them what they heard from Jesus and also this letter which they would have had and ultimately the scriptures, the canon itself where you can hear from Jesus. How do you and I hear from Jesus? We hear from Jesus by seeing how he was predicted and foreseen in the Old Testament, explained in the Gospels, shared in the book of Acts, understood and theologically adored and worshipped in the epistles. In the last book of the Bible, how we see that the end is culminated in he, he, he is coming again. A lot of people, and I don't want to digress too much on this, think that the book of Revelation is about what happens in the end of time. And it gives us an outline of that. But the book of the Revelation, you know what the word revelation means? The revelation of Jesus. That he is, that he's alive, that he's coming again. By the way, as a believer, do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus is returning to this earth to redeem his people and glorify his saints, to establish his everlasting rule on this earth in a a physical way? If you believe that, do you hope it happens today? Or are you one of those people, well, not, not until I have my first date. Or not until I have my first girlfriend or boyfriend. Or not until I have my my first kiss. Or not until I'm married. Or not until I have kids. Or not until I'm a grandparent. Not until I'm a great parent. Not until I own my house. And not until, not until, not until, not. What about Lord come quickly today? You know why people want Jesus to come quickly? Because they know him. They've learned of him. They love him. They've listened to him. And he's attractive and they want to be with him if you have heard him, and been taught in him. This is a workhorse phrase that Paul uses all throughout the book of Ephesians, in him. It means in the context of and about him, that he's the subject of all our theology. It anchors in him. How do we know that? Look at that last phrase. Just as truth is in Jesus. Truth. That's a way of describing what really matters. What really matters is in Jesus And truth instead of a lie, what's true about Jesus? Oh, my goodness. One of the most fearful verses in the Bible is in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 where Paul says, If anyone comes to you and preaches another Jesus, a different spirit, another gospel, sometimes you're too easy to kind of take that in. Don't be deceived. As I said last night, people would love to talk to you about Jesus, but not the Jesus of the Bible. People would love to talk to you about the gospel, but not the good news of the Bible. People would love to define to you the spirit, but not how the Holy Spirit comes to us defined by the word of God. Are you listening to Jesus? Read the Bible. Read the gospels. Find what he has done and said and listen to him. A third dimension of that worthy walk, learning about Jesus, listening to Jesus, 
And number three, changing because of Jesus. This is where now we get into the way the Lord affects the way we live. Changing because of Jesus. Verse 22. That in reference to your former manner of life. Whoa, stop right there. Whoa, whoa, whoa. There's a change implied here. You didn't learn Jesus vainly. You, you didn't hear him vainly. If you did... In reference to the way you used to live. That's the Gentile way of life that he described in the previous paragraph. This is talking about repenting from known sin. That you lay aside the old self, your unsaved habits, the the way you thought, the way you behaved as an unbeliever. You lay that aside. Why? It's being corrupted in accordance with the lying desires, the lusts of deceit. Very interesting phrase. Paul says the lust. Lust means a strong desire of deceit. I don't want to alarm anyone, but you have been lied to. And you've been lied to most of your life by your own desires. And your desires, the devil uses to teach you this. If you get what your flesh really wants, if you get what your lusts really desire, then You'll be happy. You know what Paul tells us? That's a lie. It's a lie. A few years ago, I I taught uh, the book of Ecclesiastes to our church, and there was an illustration that we used all the way through that became kind of a a funny thing. And uh, at the end of my teaching of this book, somebody gave me something that will make sense in a moment. But I said that the illustration (laughs) I used is that lusts and desires of, of life are like juicy fruit. You ever had a stick of juicy fruit gum? It's incredible. I mean, if you put juicy fruit on, on your tongue, it, it's, it is, there's a moment where you think, this might be manna from heaven. This is, it's amazing. It's sweet, it's juicy, it's fruity, hence juicy fruit. It's incredible. My mouth's watering thinking about juicy fruit right now. But here's the thing about juicy fruit. Has any ever, have you had a stick of juicy fruit gum? Okay, for the six of us. Um, you put this in your mouth, it's amazing. For about 10 seconds. And then something, something chemically happens in your mouth. And this wonderful explosion of flavor turns on you. And then it starts tasting sour and foul and, and your tongue gets all dry and, and you think, why did I do this? And then you have a choice. You spit it out, which would be a good choice, or, or you put more in and you keep juicy fruiting yourself to death. <laughs> you know, as silly as it sounds, that we were using this in, in our study of, of Ecclesiastes, the lusts of deceit are like juicy fruit. They, 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 they taste great at first. They just don't last. They don't provide ultimate lasting satisfaction like Jesus does. They lie to you. Have you believed the lies that your lusts tell you that if you will fulfill them, you will be happy? Here's the problem. You will be happy for a moment, but it doesn't last, and it brings guilt and condemnation. Look at verse 23. He says to think biblically that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now, big word. uh, Dr. Ware has been telling you, uh, Papa Ware has been telling you some Greek words. Here's another one. This is noeo. This is the, we call this the noetic effects of the fall, which means the, the way that the fall into sin affects your thinking. That's it. So much said. Now, just for a minute, I want you to look at what the emphasis is on thinking, on your mind. From the old self to the new self, from the way of unbelievers to the way of believers. Go back to the text we looked at last night in verse 17. Now I say this and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their what? Mind. There's a mental word. Being darkened in their what? Understanding. There's another one. Excluded from the life of God because of the what? Ignorance that is in them because of the hardness of their heart. That's another mind phrase. The heart is the mission control central of your decision making. So mind, understanding, ignorance, hardness of heart. 
Now look at the emphasis in verse 20. You did not learn. That's a mental process. If you've heard, that's mental. Taught, that's learning. Truth is in Jesus. And now we come to verse 23. Renewed in the spirit of your mind. Oh, we could go on just having just a minute of fun. Paul prays in verse 17 of chapter 1 that the God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of the revelation and the knowledge there's knowing of him. In chapter 4, verse 13, we see that we're increasing in the knowledge of the Son of God. Chapter 5, verse 7, don't be partakers with unbelievers. You, formerly they were in, you were in darkness, now you Light of the Lord, walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to do what? Learn. There's another mental word. What is pleasing to the Lord? Look at 517. So don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You see the emphasis there? Listen, Christianity is not for the lazy. You have to learn, you have to lean into it. It's to understand, it's to comprehend. You're renewed in the spirit of your thinking, of your mind. Christianity is a rational religion. Walking worthy in Christ is to change your thinking. Yes, emotions are a part of being made in the image of God, and we have emotions, and we praise God for them. But emotions need to be behind our thinking and our mind. Why do we do this? Why? Verse 24, to become a holy person. Put on the new self, the new you, the believing you, which in the likeness of God, there's a lot there. He'll tell us in chapter 5 to imitate God. The likeness of God, which has been created. This is the new you, if you're a believer, in righteousness and holiness of that truth. He just described truth is in Jesus. So the truth about Jesus motivates you to be righteous and holy. The way we change to become a new person is studying the truth that's in Jesus to become righteous and holy. Can I ask you, where does righteousness and holiness fit into your Christian vocabulary? Do Do you talk? Do you pursue being holy, being righteous? That's the worthy walk. I love how Peter finishes his book in 2 Peter 3, verse 18. He says, grow, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Are you growing in the knowledge of him Remember axios, which is matching. You cannot grow into a worthy walking believer without knowing the Savior who you're trying to become like. So let me give you three quick bullet points of application, can I? Number one, will you make it a life goal and a daily pursuit to understand and know Jesus better? Make it a life goal and daily pursuit to understand and know Jesus better. Not just know about the Christian faith, about church, as wonderful as those are, but to know the living, resurrected Savior better who is saying, come to me if you're weary. Number two, you knew this was coming. Read your Bible seeing it as the revelation of God about his son. Read the Bible, seeing it as the revelation of God about his son. And this is number three, where you're going to head right now into your small groups. Are you ready for this? This this shouldn't be just small group fodder. This 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 is the language of Christianity. Are you ready? Train yourself to talk often and curiously about Jesus. I'll explain that in a second. Train yourself to talk often and curiously about Jesus. 
There is nothing more interesting to a Christian than the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is amazing. Are you amazed? Are you trying to be more amazed? Your curriculum for Christianity is the person of Christ. Don't miss him. Father, give us curiosity to know the Lord Jesus more, to know him better, more intimately. And I pray that these students never confuse anything for their faith that would distract them away from Jesus as the central focus. Knowing him, Lord, will make us walk worthy. So reveal him to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen.